you can save a few bits. And that's what's driving all the interesting, um, all the curiosity, but also the creativity of any um, intelligent system. Creativity and curiosity are just the same um, aspects of the same principle, um, trying to make new data, more data, which is compressible in previously unknown ways. And we are currently uh, implementing uh, in a more complex system these principles on a humanoid like this, um, which is called the iCurb, and there's a big European project where, you, um, where the goal is to implement these principles such that you have all these things again in place. You need a predictor or compressor of the data that improves over time, and, and all the new data that is coming in, it's more, getting more and more data, um, but, but you constantly try to compress it, and then you constantly try to find new patterns, better ways of compressing, and then you get the motivation for the controller that is selecting the actions, the eye movements, the dances, or whatever the robot executes, which lead to new patterns that aren't already in his repertoire. So direct exploration of the world through science, or just like a baby that is exploring what can it do with its fingers, etc. I think it's all driven by this very simple, basic principle here. Let me give you a little example, um, an application of this. I tried uh, a thousand times to come up with a very simple geometric uh, description of human faces, and usually everything you try, it really looks bad and stupid and awful, and suddenly something comes along which doesn't look so bad, you know, and then you see, oh, there is really, there's a simple uh, geometric scheme. Now, this one here is um, a binary scheme which is based on certain very simple um, well, coordinate systems, and you always take half of the original uh, grid that you get there to define then all the basic features of this face, like, for example, the slant of the eyebrows, the thickness of the eyebrows, the, uh, uh, the, the slant of the si facial sides, and all these things. And um, it takes a long time to come up with any um, geometric scheme that makes sense at all. Most of them just look horrible. Now, of course, I'm not the uh, first guy who's trying to do that. Leonardo da Vinci himself, he also tried to... to um, to come up with um, proportion studies where you um, define the basic facial features through um, mathematical rules, but, um, but not to the same extent, not in the sense that you, also, that you really describe all the slopes and all the details of these, um, of these images, of these uh, facial structures. Now, um, this face, of course, is interesting only as long as the regularity in it, the symmetries, etc., are not yet known, but then it becomes boring. Like every data that you see, over time it becomes boring because once you understand what's going on there uh, and you see and incorporate the, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the regularity and the short uh, program that describes it, um, you, you, it gets boring and you want to see something else. Uh, let me give you another example of uh, very compactly encoding um, images. Let me start with a bunch of large circles, which look very much like what many kids draw with a circle um, um, when they're young. And then we add four times as many circles with half the size. And then we add uh, 16 times as many cir circles with one-fourth the size, and so on. So you see it's getting more and more circles. And now the rule is I can use, I can create new drawings, but only by using arcs that are on these legal circles that I get there. And there are a few large circles and many small circles. Now, I can encode drawings like this one here, for example, by just describing, by, num uh, by enumerating all the circles, for example, giving each of them a little number. The large ones get, la uh, get small numbers. The small ones get m larger and larger numbers. And then you can... Uh, very compactly encode drawings like this one here. Again, that's, uh, most of the things you try, they don't look like nothing. But, but if you try hard, then in the end you find something that is acceptable, and uh, then you've got a low-complexity artwork uh, like this one. Now here I'm removing all the green circles, which I'm not using, and leave only the red circles, and I'm re which are the only ones that I need to specify the details of the drawing. And finally, I get um, a very simple... A drawing that can be encoded by very few bits of information, just a few lines of code, much more uh, compressible than, for example, a JPEG encoding of the same image or a GIF encoding. And that would be then an example of low-complexity art, uh, which I defined in 1997 in a, in a journal uh, which is um, dedicated to such things. Leonardo is the journal. 
And uh, let me give you another example. Again, the same scheme, which can be used to very compactly um, encode drawings that follow these basic rules. And, and here we see a, a self-similar femme fractal. Uh, femme fractal. So I remo I'm removing all the circles that I'm not using, and then only the green circles are left, which are the only ones that I need to specify the details of, these, uh, of this drawing. And then finally, uh, we have again a, an image, a low complexity artwork, if you want, that is, can be encoded by very, very few bits of information. What is next in artificial um, creativity and artificial curiosity? Well, our first implementations, they use these feed forward networks, which are just um, devices that learn to map an input to an output and um, over time become better mappings between inputs and outputs. But, um, but now we are much more focused on these recurrent neural networks. Recurrent neural networks, how many people in this room know what that might be? Recurrent. So that's a math mathematical model which is very much like, um, like, well, it seems a lot like what your brain is doing. It has feedback connections that allow it to implement arbitrary programs, mapping arbitrary input sequences to arbitrary output sequences. So it's a general computer, and it turns out that there are ways of training the weights, the weight matrix um, of these recurrent networks which implement the program such that the whole thing becomes a better descri description of the data that you want to model with it. And um, just to give you a few examples, what you can do with these things, this is a picture of Alex Graves, my postdoc, who used to be a PhD student at CIA, but now a postdoc in München. And, um, and currently, the best connected handwriting um, systems are using recurrent networks like this. So uh, there are particularly useful um, variants of recurrent networks that we developed at the at CIA, and um, they are currently the state of uh, the art in connected handwriting recognition, which is much harder than isolated digit recognition. And what else can you do with that? Or you can predict time series like this. So here you have a, a time series, and it looks a little bit like a stock market chart, maybe. And you give that to your investment advisor, and he's supposed to predict the future of that. But, but mine is completely unable to do that. And, but then our networks uh, can pick up the regularity. There's a regularity in this, um, in this curve here, and very exactly predict the future without seeing it. So that would be another application. Or you have robots um, that, that have tiny little actuators, and they are working on, well, they are designed to, to work um, in surgery settings, and you have a surgeon that shows them how to, do and how to tie a knot in very confined uh, cavities, which is hard, but this is then the first robot that learned to, um, to, to tie knots like that using recurrent uh, neural networks, like the ones that we developed. But, so once you've got these compression mach machines, these recurrent networks, which are just supervised compressors of the data history, and they become better and better at predicting the data, and therefore also become, become better and better at, at compressing it, uh, then you still you have to look at what happens to these reward signals that you get as you are getting a better compression. And then these reward signals, they go to the, um, to the reward optimizers, to the, reward, uh, to the reinforcement learning algorithm. And what is a good choice... Um, well, um, we often use certain novel techniques for co-evolution. Let me see whether I can get the cursor going there. Oh, there we are. So up here, we see no, no. We see a little robot which is um, which has learned to balance a pole. Maybe you see that it has three wheels. It's controlled by again a recurrent neural network. But now there's no teacher that tells the robot what to do. In the beginning, the pole always fell down. But then after some time, it maximized trial length and became better and better. But then it was starting to run against the wall all the time. And finally, it learned to use its sensors without a teacher uh, to to go away from the wall whenever it's getting too close. And uh, down here, let me see. Down here, we see the same robot, but now with uh, two poles on top of each other. So now here there's a joint in between, and this robot, after 4,000 iterations, trials, has learned to, to balance another pole on top of the first one. Here you see that. But now it's not perfect yet. I, I, I showed you something which isn't perfect yet just to show you that there's really two poles on top of each other. 1,000 iterations more, and it knows how to do that. 